Welcome to the Back Brief Podcast. I'm your host, Rod Rodriguez. Uh, and on this show, we are bringing back the amazing uh, Jack Murphy because Jack has uncovered a, a new story, something him and I have been talking about in the background as this thing was developing. Um, it's it's explosive to say the least. And I know we're, we, I keep using that word because it's kind of a fun word to use in this, but there's absolutely nothing fun or uh, nothing funny about the uh, the very serious uh, story that that Jack has uncovered. Jack, thanks for being on the show, bud. Yeah, thanks for having me back, Rod. Uh, Jack, you know, we've talked about this back and forth about how the story was developing, some of the things you were uncovering. And this has some, what you've uncovered has some serious ramifications, not just for uh, special operations, but for the regular army and, and in terms of how we do business in combat. Yeah, absolutely. Even for law enforcement officers as well um, at times. Um, so I was looking at the issue of you know post-traumatic stress, which leads you to traumatic brain injury or TBI um, and how these things are related to another large issue um, called soldier, you know, we would call soldier suicides, suicides amongst active duty soldiers and veterans. Um, and in the special operations community, they are the rate is quite a bit higher than the conventional military. And when you start looking at these issues, there are so many different rabbit holes that you can go down uh, as far as looking at the psychology, looking at the physiology, the, the, the actual physical injuries that soldiers take. Um, and some of those physical injuries are unseen because they're happening inside the brain. There's actual brain damage happening in the context of traumatic brain injuries that soldiers are, in, in this case, we're talking about that they receive through blasts, um, be they the firing of high caliber weapons, um, being caught in improvised explosive device strikes, or um, explosive breaching. Uh, so explosive breaching, just for those who aren't familiar, what we're talking about here is when tactical teams enter and clear a structure or a building, there are different manners of breaching. Uh, that is getting through a locked door or even a wall or other barricade to get into the building, into that structure. Um, so there's mechanical breaching where you use hooligan tools, pry bars, battering rams to bust down the door. Uh, another technique is explosive breaching. So if you need to get into the structure quickly, the door is locked, it's barricaded, whatever the case may be, you can use explosives, specially designed explosives, uh, charges that are specially constructed to blow down that door so that an entry team, a tactical team can quickly enter through that breach site and get the, you know, the fundamentals of close quarter battle being surprise, speed and violence of action. And an explosive breach helps operators achieve that. But the fallout from it is that explosive breaches being explosive can also cause operators to get TBI, get the traumatic brain injury, which has been um, linked to suicides by doctors and researchers. It's not just me. They, they've actually statistically shown that quite a few of the people, quite a few of the soldiers who commit suicide had TBI. So there is a linkage there. Um, to what degree it's uh, a causal link is something that we can still debate, I believe. I don't think the science has settled on that. There's still a lot we don't know about TBI and the effect that it has on, on the operator or on the soldier. But the more I looked at this and why it becomes an issue is because the way we are applying the scientific uh, equations that govern what the minimum safe distance is from explosive breaching or explosive blasts is wrong. The way it's applied, it's not that the math is broken, that the math is bad, that it doesn't work. It's that those equations are not designed for what we are using them to do to calculate minimum safe distance. We're misapplying the equations and it's a big cultural problem in the military that we are putting the soldier right next to the breach site and they are getting TBIs many TBIs. Some, some soldiers are autopsy, their brains are autopsied, and it's found that they have 23, 24, 25 TBIs. And this is leading to all sorts of cognitive issues down the line for troops, not just suicide, but I mean, actual psychological problems. And it's not their fault. It's not because they're, uh, they're PTSD'd out, you know, it would take your cliche, whatever it is. It's not because they're, they're John Rambo running around town, um, you know, reliving the horrors of war. It's because there's actually been damage done to their brain that 
you cannot cognitively think right. And it is a physical injury. It's in the article I explained. It's like a soldier being shot through the spine, not being able to walk. We understand that because you can see it. We're talking about an actual injury to the brain. It's not just like a psychological problem. Like you go to therapy and they're going to make you, you all better it, 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 by talking to a therapist about it. It's more complicated than that. I'm curious. You, you say that these blasts that uh, the, the formulas, the equations that we're currently using, they're using the wrong equations. Where, where are these equations coming from? How are they, how did they get it so wrong? Well, the equations were initially developed um, like after the second world war. And a, a lot of uh, this stuff was actually developed in the context of nuclear weapons, but, uh, but also um, in the context of TNT um, and the net explosive weight of TNT, even though TNT is not used for explosive breaching, it just isn't, nobody uses it for that. Um, so it's sort of a legacy and it was initially designed for explosive ordnance technicians to um, explode uh, unexploded ordnance. Like, so you find a bunch of bombs on the battlefield, you put them in a hole and you, you put some charges next to them, some TNT, let's suppose, and you, ex you explode it out in the middle of the desert or the jungle or whatever. The calculations, the equations were designed for in that context um, to tell the, the EOD technician how far away from the blast you can be so that it's safe, so that you're safe from like missiles, uh, missile fragments, so uh, shrapnel essentially, or blast overpressure. Now, if you're in the open desert um, setting off an explosion in a controlled sense like that, then the equation is right. That's what it, that's what it is used for. Um, the K equation specifically was designed to assess structural damage to buildings in that sort of context. These equations were never designed to assess the damage to a human body in a complex urban environment. So what I mean by that is that there's a real difference between setting off that big explosion out in the middle of the desert or the jungle and setting off an explosive charge in an urban environment with a tactical team nearby. Um, because urban explosives, uh, urban explosions are much more complex because you have all these walls, ceilings, floors, different buildings across the street. And what happens is the blast wave, instead of just propagating outwards in a consistent manner, it's bouncing off surfaces and it creates what's called reflective waves. And the reflective waves bounce off things and they come back at the tactical team. In some cases, those reflective waves merge with one another and form a peak wave. So urban explosives, and specifically we're talking about urban breaching, is much more complicated than the sort of like traditional, you could think of like military demolitions where we're blowing up a bridge outside or we're, we're setting off a, a cache of explosives way out in the middle of nowhere. This is a very different, and what we're doing is we're taking those legacy equations and we're misapplying them to modern day counterterrorism operations. Take us through that experience. Some of our listeners, some of our viewers have never been there. Uh, even our veterans, some of our guys weren't combat MOSs, much less special operations. Uh, take us through that experience of these breaching charges going off and the effects that you felt uh, when these waves hit you. Sure. There are, there are many different uh, what we would call tactics, techniques, and procedures. Um, and when I, when I asked USASAC what their current protocols are, they won't tell me because they say they're sensitive. Um, but I'll give you, yeah, the, the basic run through of it. So you're hitting a target structure. You're going to come up in assault teams. Uh, you're going to stack somewhere near the door, a breacher and somebody pulling security is going to go up to the door with the charge, which would be a, a strip charge uh, made out of debt cord or sometimes explosive cutting tape it's made out of. And you're going to place the charge that's been pre-made um, back at the base. You're going to place it on the door. Um, then you're going to string the initiation system into it. It's, uh, you might actually do that as before you get up to the door, of course, um, so that you have it prepped. But there's the initiation system and the explosive charge. They're kept separate for safety reasons. And then the, the initiation system is strung into the explosives somewhere near the objective area. Um, you're not going to want to be like riding around in the back of the Humvee with a bunch of prime charges, right? For, again, for safety reasons. You put the charge with the initiation system on the door, and then you fall back. Um, you the initiation system, oftentimes uh, we use shock tube, um, which there's a, a, chemical, a chemical reaction in it when you set it off. And if you look at pictures of, uh, uh, on like, of uh, soldiers setting off door charges, you'll see this. It looks like a lightning bolt in the picture. That's shock tube. 
um, there's actually uh, an, a chemical reaction taking place in the tube that sets off the blasting caps um, that initiates the charge. So anyway, you peel back from the door where the charge is. You're in the uh, stack with the tactical team and whoever's been designated to um, set off the, the explosive is going, there's going to be a countdown over the radio. Someone's going to be in charge. They typically say something that I, like, uh, they'd say, I have control, I have control, and initiate the countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. The person who is setting off the charge is going to have a, a fuse igniter. Uh, or there are different types, but there's going to be a safety on it that they're going to remove. And then there's going to be some sort of push pin or, or lever that they're going to depress uh, to initiate the explosive. It happens, the, the door, if the charge works, uh, which it usually does because uh, <laughs> it's called P for plenty, uh, which is nothing. It, it's just a saying, really. It's not really an equation. You're using more explosives than you need to because no one wants a failed charge. Everyone's just going to look like a huge asshole if you have a failed charge and, and it fails to breach. So the charge goes off. It blows in the door. The person who initiated it, because you have that now useless shock tube and initiator, they're going to toss that thing off to the side, uh, gain control of their primary weapon, their, their M4 or their HK, whatever weapon they're carrying, and the stack is going to flow through the breach point into the structure and clear it. Um, when that blast wave hits you, I mean, definitely in training or in combat, you're close enough that you feel it. It hits you. Um now, how strong it is depends on how far away you are and also the reflective waves we were just talking about. Um, I, I mean, I, I definitely have felt it. I have spoken to many other people who, in their situations, they were knocked to their knees uh, when the charge went off, that it was that powerful. I've spoken to other people who are knocked out, actually knocked unconscious when the charge went, went off. And arguably, this is because we are using unsafe practices, um, because there is a sort of um, a macho aspect of operator culture about getting as close to the breach point as you can and flowing in as quickly as you can to try to achieve that surprise speed and violence of action. A lot of it is based on misconceptions, according to some combat leaders, um, that the, the, the explosive, of course, the, the normal line of thinking is that that explosion is shocking everyone inside the room, inside the building. So all the bad guys are caught by surprise. They're so shocked. Um, it's going to take them a few seconds to reorient themselves. And during that time, you want operators already flowing through the breach point to take advantage of that shock. But I've talked to people who have said that really the people on the outside of the building absorb more of the blast than the people on the other side because it's tamped by the door and by the air gap between the door and everyone else in the house. So someone who's deeper in the room, somebody who's deeper in the house, they're not really going to be shocked uh, per se by that explosive, that explosive breach. Um, the people, the operators on the outside stacked on the door are actually eating more of the blast than the people inside the building. So there are some misconceptions about what we're trying to accomplish here and why we're doing this and why we're placing tactical teams so close to the explosion itself. So we we understand that these equations are the, the equations that were originally designed that they've applied to uh, these breaching operations aren't correct. The, these these equations, the equations themselves are correct, but they're designed for a different use, a different right. completely different uh, environment. We took those and kind of jammed them into a different type of operation. Yep. Um, how long have we known this? How long have we understood we're, we, we're, we're putting the square peg round hole kind of thing? At least since the 1980s. Uh, and one of the big takeaways from the subject matter experts I spoke to for this article, who, by the way, are Chuck O'Connor, who is the master breacher for SEAL Team 6, and Mike Vining, who is the master breacher for Delta Force, so these are incredibly competent, credible, and credentialed people that I spoke to. They both agreed on this subject. Um, they say that we have known since the 1980s. Um, and back in those days, the only units that did explosive breaching were Delta, SEAL Team 6, and the FBI's hostage rescue team 
HRT. Um, around that time period in the late 80s, everyone started explosive breaching. This technique became more commonplace in law enforcement and the military. And the bad tactics, techniques, and procedures really propagated all across the community at that point and continue to be used to this day. So if we've known since the, the 80s, 90s, if we've known since then, uh, it's 2020. Why are you writing this article? Why, why is this not something that was fixed in 2000 or 2004, 2010? Well, that's a good question. And I think it remains to be fully answered as to why there are PhDs, researchers, and other uh, engineers who develop these safety protocols uh, continue to give bad information to the soldier, to the police officer. Why are they still doing that? And I think that's a very good question um, that needs to be answered. Uh, Chuck O'Connor explained to me that in his entire career, he's been working with explosives for over 40 years at this point. He said, I have never met one of these PhDs or engineers who is willing to place their own bodies where they say we should place tactical teams for an explosive breach. They say that their equations are validated. And he says, will you go and place yourself where you're saying we should place these operators? And they, he said, I've never met one who will do it. And so I started in counseling and be like, hey, dude, fix this. On the days off of being an army ranger or infantry dude, I volunteered my time in the casualty collection points. Here comes a family of seven and they're burned miserably bad. We start the process of giving them ketamine to take away the pain and then we start scrubbing all the skin off their bodies that's damaged and then add silverdine to it and then wrap it up and hopefully they come back the next day. I would leave there every day smelling like burnt flesh and it's stuck in, in, in your nose and you remember that and the smiles of their, their faces and having kids the same similar age, it was uh, it was heavy for me for, for you know, a 25, 26 year old kid never expecting that it was heavy and I didn't know it would weigh so much on me. And it does, man, and it does still to this day. This is just one of those stories where um, it, it kind of chips away at your faith uh, in the system, yeah. right? I well, mean well the, the flip side to it is also that it's operator culture. So yeah, the science is broken. The, the, um, the safety protocols that are being given to the operator are wrong, that they're broken. And part of operator culture is that we just assume that these things are vetted when they've been given to us. And the science and the facts of the matter and the, the continued uh, occurrence of TBIs has demonstrated that, no, this information is not vetted, that it has not been vetted. Um, but it's just something as soldiers, we just assume it must be. Um, now, the other aspect of operator culture is what I was talking about, that there is a predilection towards getting as close to the breach point as possible, even when it's not necessary. Um, that it's like the tough guy thing to do, that we feel like we're battling for nanoseconds to get inside the building, which oftentimes is not true. Um, there may be uh, occasional missions of national importance where the operator has to assume more risk, but those are few and far between. There's no reason why we need to do this every objective, every mission, or every training mission for that matter. Um, so what I'm getting at is that there are a lot of operators out there, a lot of soldiers who will just blow off the safety considerations in the first place. So that's what has to be done as far as operator culture that, that needs to be adjusted, that uh, we need to start following the safety mechanisms and the leadership of these units needs to start enforcing them. So there's, there's two sides to this uh, and all of these things need to be fixed in order to better protect these guys. I think it's interesting that you bring up uh, the operator culture um, there and and you know you guys expect when you're told this is how it's going to work, this is how it works. That there's been testing, that there's been validation yeah. that supports what it is that they're telling you to do. Uh, you're putting yourself at risk. You are a high highly valuable asset. You know all the amount, uh, the money and training that's been put into these 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 operators. Um, I think the other part of that is you know for the law enforcement guys, for EOD, for everyone else that's taking these 
uh, you know, the FBI, whoever's taking these uh, tactics, they're usually being taught by somebody from the special operations world, somebody either retired or they'll do a joint operation. They bring those folks in, hey, this is how we do business. It's like a trickle down uh, operator mentality or operator culture. It's this trickle down effect that if I am an FBI guy or if I'm a local uh, law enforcement guy, and I've got a former SEAL, I've got a former special forces guy who's teaching us breaching operations. My, I don't come into this class thinking, hmm, I wonder if that equation is, if that makes right. sense, depending on right. where I'm at. Maybe I should crunch the numbers and see if I carry the one, if I get the same thing. The assumption is that you are the subject matter expert. You bring this, this these special operations military experience to the table. Therefore, what you're teaching is correct. So what do we do now? What, what do we do with this information? So you wrote this article, kind of blew the lid off of this thing. It's something that um, they've known about for you know, a couple of decades, but nothing's really been done. Do you, do you foresee this, this the, maybe there, some, some type of action will be taken, a call to arms as, as it were? I really don't know. Uh, I think that there's a couple of things that can be done both officially and, and informally. Um, you know, so far the informal system has not worked because it has not proven to be self-correcting. Um, we've just continued to do the same damn thing over and over again. Um, but these units uh, or the military DOD wide, they could come together on their own and uh, start to standardize some safety protocols and start to put some, some policies into effect all on their own. Um, you know, SOCOM itself, Special Operations Command, could start to look at this in a more holistic manner and start to uh, validate some actual um, protocols or equations or whatever whatever uh, minimum safe distance uh, protocols they want to put into place. Um, now, on a larger level, on a federal level, there could be, right now, this is interesting, there is no federal authority, there's no agency, there's no institute that standardizes safety uh, for explosive breaching across the board. It just doesn't exist. So there is no one with any sort of like oversight authority. There is no one who is like, um, uh, like, like with weapons, with guns in the military, okay? They are extensively tested in a very formalized setting. I mean, it's super, <laughs> it's actually overly bureaucratic, I think would be the criticism of it. Um, but there are, there are federal guidelines and standards for testing weapons before the military uses them. Um, there, there are all these things that happen there. There's nothing like that for explosive breaching. It's every branch of service and oftentimes every unit is just doing their own thing. They're just doing whatever they want. Um, you're, you'll see things like uh, the Marines, they still believe to this day that if you have a ballistic shield or a ballistic blanket, you can get right up on top of the blast. And you can see, uh, you go on DVIDs, the DOD photo archive, and you see picture after picture of them right on top of the breach holding this stupid blanket up in front of them, which does nothing to protect your brain from TBI. I mean, I guess, I guess it'll protect you from uh, shrapnel, but it's not doing anything for your TBI. And everyone knows, I mean, people know this, this practice is unsafe but it continues to be taught to this day and it's hurting soldiers. It's hurting Marines. Um, so there arguably there should be some sort of oversight uh, agency or Institute uh, on top uh, in the federal government. That's overseeing all of this. That's vetting the information. Um, but no one is right now. So as, as it stands, it's kind of a big mess. Uh, you could even take it a step further and say that these things should be codified into federal law um, that there's, that the practitioners have, legal responsibilities. Um, like a friend of mine uh, and somebody who I, I quoted in the article, he's an aerospace engineer. He was saying, when we put rockets into space, there are federal safety laws that we have to adhere to. And if we don't, and something goes wrong, like people will go to jail. Uh, in, in this case, in, uh, when we're talking about demolitions and explosive breaching, it appears that there really are no such laws. Um, so it's, it, but again, I mean, law enforcement officers could still be held liable if they screw it up and kill someone. So, I, I mean, right now it seems like a, it sounds to me from the people I talked to that it's kind of a convoluted mess and there is no centralized oversight authority on it. It sounds like this is an opportunity 
for a full, uh, maybe a, a full bird, maybe somebody with a star. I foresee a future joint center of excellence for, for this, maybe explosives, maybe for breaching, maybe for, uh, you know, some, something here, but uh, the army in general, has been in love with these centers of excellence as you were, you know, they keep popping up everywhere. But maybe this is a good thing. Maybe this is the kind of thing that we need in the army. Maybe there should be a joint center of excellence for um, this type of research. Um, I, I'm just surprised, uh, EOD, um, you know, did, I would have thought that, and again, this is just my simple, uh, you know, uh, reptilian brain here working. I thought, if you're doing anything with explosives or charges or breaching, there's something coming to you from EOD. I thought EOD would have been the, the ominous dominus, the people that, that, that bless off. I would have thought they were the authority on how to do what you do and how much you need of that to do it with. Well, EOD is not, they're not explosive breachers per se. Their, their uh, wheelhouse is explosive ordnance disposal. And they may have other associated responsibilities, but the people doing explosive breaching are rangers, delta operators, marine infantry guys, uh, Navy SEALs. Uh, they, are, they are not EOD technicians generally that are explosively breaching. Uh, some units like Delta, they've even formed a specialized uh, special entry troop to do like the heavy breaching because it becomes such an involved task and it's very technical, so they want specialists who do that. Um, but typically, they're not they're not EOD guys. Wow. Um, like I said, th this does chip away at one's faith in the system. Uh, you think somebody's looking out for you. You think at least, like you you mentioned about the the weapon systems. You know, an M sixteen. They're not going to field. It takes them forever to field a new rifle, a new uh, a pistol because of all the research and they're always like, yeah. let's compare these different methods. I mean, hell, how, how long did it take before we went from uh, the prone, you know, just shooting prone uh, pop-up targets to, hey, we should, you know, combat has, has required us to apply a new type of marksmanship. Um, it, it's, just, it's just really disappointing. Where do we go from here, Jack? I mean, I don't know. I'm a journalist. I'm not a, I'm not a policymaker. Um, all I can say is that, you know, we have a real problem uh, in the forest. We have a cultural problem. We have a, a, a technical problem as well. And, and it's literally killing soldiers right now. It's literally killing service members. Um, so what the, I mean, the, the people I talk to propose creating some sort of centralized oversight authority um, in the federal government, um, what that form would take, what form it would take. Uh, I, I'm not necessarily qualified to answer. I think you'd have to go to um, the explosive breaching community. You'd have to go to the EOD technicians. You, you'd have to relook at all the science behind it and, and figure that one out. And where can we go to find out more about you, to find this article? Where can we go to get more Jack Murphy? Well, yeah, the, the article is on connectingvets.com. It's called Special Ops Has a Broken Culture with Explosive Breaching That Can Lead to TBIs. Um, so yeah, please go check it out. There's a lot of information in there about TBI, about soldier suicide, about the broken science, the broken math, um, and, and possible solutions. Um, there's also possible technological solutions that we haven't really talked about here. Um, so that all that's in the article. Um, so definitely check it out and you can find me on Twitter at Jack Murphy, RGR, um, you can also find uh, my podcast on YouTube. It's called The Team House, and we interview uh, a lot of special operations veterans, a lot of uh, intelligence community folks on there um, every week, live, Fridays at 8 p.m. Fridays at 8 p.m. Uh, the Team Room Talk. Is that right? Team House? The, the Team House. The team house. house. team House Talk. What am I saying? It is that maybe I've got a TBI. I don't even know anymore. Off my kilter <laughs> today. Off my kilter. Folks, uh, that was amazing. The wonderful Jack Murphy. As always, thanks for being on the show, man. Yeah, thanks for having me, Rod. Folks, uh, that was Jack Murphy. Of course, you can find this article and so much more. Uh, ConnectingVets.com. 
go check them out. We've got podcasts. We have articles. We've got uh, Instagram. We're on Facebook. Wherever you are looking for the latest and greatest news in the world of veteran culture, uh, we are there for you. Connecting Vets.com. I'm Rod Rodriguez. That was Jack Murphy. Uh, we're done. We are out. 